I have an important job. Every day, I evaluate various containers for hazardous waste, up to and including medical waste, to determine whether or not they are suitable for a given application. The vast majority of my work comes from pressurized containers that hold, usually, harmless compounds and are extremely high pressures, hundreds of times greater than that of atmospheric pressure. When these vessels fail, people die. Period. I have been in this business for nearly 40 years. I'm approaching retirement and I have commissioned more of these pressure vessels than I can count. Thousands of containers are out there in all sorts of industries being worked on and around by people completely unaware of one fairly important fact. The person who commissioned those vessels has heard voices in their head since they were 14 years old. There are three of them. One of them is something of a snarker. Another is mostly silent and very childish. And the third is frighteningly, violently insane. The last one didn't show up until I was graduating college. Every time I have stamped a container, I heard a soft voice in my ear chiding me for missing an opportunity to kill somebody. I'm commanded to steer into oncoming traffic every time I drive home. I've caught myself idly listing the ingredients to build a bomb or a meth lab or a homemade firearm more times than I care to list. That voice has been my indicator for the integrity of every device I have ever commissioned over my entire career. If ever I am about to stamp something and the voice is silent, I recheck my numbers. Truthfully though, I have no idea how much separation there is between me and them. How much of what they say comes from me and how much of what I do comes from them. Every day, Thousands of people go to work in environments that are certified as being safe only because a complete madman put a stamp on a piece of paper. I've driven away my wife, my children, and my family to keep my secret safe. Once I retire, my only companion will be an illustrious professional reputation built on trust. With retirement looming, I ask myself every day whether or not I should just come clean and check myself into a mental hospital. I believe I would rather die. And that single thought is the only thing that is answered by complete silence from the others sharing my head. I'm using a friend's account because older brother knows my reddit username. I don't think all parents that have donor babies are ends. Yes, it's pretty selfish to bear a child just to use them secure, but I've seen a lot of parents with terminally ill children and usually they're just desperate. Any parent can lose their senses when their kid is dying. Mine, especially my mother, however, was straight up ends. And crazy too. So sometime in preschool my sister was diagnosed with Fanconi anemia. She was going to need transplants and neither of my parents nor my older brother's tissue was compatible with her. So they had another baby. I wasn't a cherry-picked test tube baby, I was conceived by regular intercourse, so there was no guarantee that I was going to be a viable donor, but I happened to be a match. I wish I wasn't. First, it was my bone marrow. I don't even remember it, I was a toddler. I do remember, though, that my entire life revolved around being a tissue donor. I was not allowed to play any sports. I can't risk injury because who knows when my sister is going to need a part of my body. I couldn't eat a cookie or anything that's not vegetables or fruits or tofu or chicken breast. I had to maintain impeccable health so my organs or blood or whatever would be ready for harvest at any given time. I wasn't allowed to take any medicine because my sister might need emergency surgery anytime so how could I let drugs stream through my veins? My mom actually made a huge scene when a school nurse gave me Tylenol for my headache. No summer camps, can't risk going far away from my sister. But nothing really happened for years. My sister seemed alright so I thought she was just paranoid. Then there was renal failure. I think the doctors explained why my sister's kidneys failed at one point but I, 
I don't remember. I was 12 and didn't understand any of the medical terms. No one cared to talk me into it or even help me understand what's going on. As a child, I didn't get to make my own medical decision. And if my parents said, I'm doing it, that's all they ever needed. I just knew I had to have surgery. Being cut open to have my organ extracted and being in hospital for weeks was a lot for a 12 year old to go through. Naturally, I was going to complain about it, but whenever I seemed remotely unhappy about the whole thing, my mom just bashed me and treated me like a cold-blooded psychopath who wanted her sister dead. My mom's craziness drove relatives and neighbors away. The incident with school nurse and her threatening to sue the school and stuff made school faculty secretly hate me too. I had no friends because I couldn't participate in after-school activities or go to birthday parties because there are cakes. My dad buried himself at work to escape from my crazy mother in this whole depressing situation. Brother was always either playing video games for hours or sneaking into the wine cellar to get intoxicated. At least my parents compensated him for their absence with money. He had what all teenagers dreamed of. Unlimited credit card and parents who don't care. I'm not, I'm not saying my brother had it easy, but he wasn't the one whose kidneys were taken away. At least he had time and money to play with and lots of phony friends though they only liked him for having loose parents, hence a place where they can do anything, and money. I literally got nothing, nobody to rely on. I studied like a monster. I figured that if I graduate high school early, then I could go to college early and I could get away from this whole thing sooner. Well, I have never been so wrong. My mother actually forged rejection letters from the universities far away, so I'd have no choice but to go to a school in my area. My school required all freshmen to live in the dorm, but my mother somehow made them make an exception. I guess she needs to be there for her terminally ill sister is a good enough reason to bend the rules. When I was 19, the sister developed liver tumor, and she needed liver transplant. I was an adult, so I could finally decide against it, but mother threatened that she will stop paying my tuition. I said I would rather be in debt until I die than be coerced into surgery, but then she screamed that I couldn't even get a loan without her signing the forms. I had a breakdown. I actually went up to the rooftop of the building thinking of suicide, but one of the doctors talked me out of it. I ended up giving her part of my liver, but I wasn't too upset about my liver. It will grow back and I was going to give it if they eventually failed to find another donor in the system. My mother's control over my life is what scared me so much. After a liver transplant, my sister didn't survive the post-operative complication. I wasn't even sad. All I could think was that I was free. I had to force myself not to smile at her funeral. I do really sound like a cold-blooded psycho now, but without her, I could finally be myself and not some backup plan in case her own organs failed. The first thing I did after her funeral was applying to universities in foreign countries for transfer so I could get the hell away from the people who treated me like a pig at a butcher house strip me of my life and take away whatever body part they needed. I'm gonna start a grad school stem cell research program in a month and it got me thinking about what got me into this field in the first place. Maybe someday I could grow organs so no more people like myself have to suffer. I recently found out about Missing 411 from a friend and upon hearing about it remembered something very strange that happened to me in the Lincoln National Forest in South Central New Mexico when I was six or seven years old. He told me to share my story here. My grandparents owned a trailer near Sacramento, New Mexico, in the Lincoln National Forest in the mid-90s. And my mother, two siblings and I visited on a weekend sometime during that era. I had two teenage male cousins that were also visiting the same weekend. While there, my two cousins offered to take my mother, siblings and I on a hike. We left shortly after sunrise, our first morning of the trip. The last couple of hours of the hike were normal enough, nothing worth noting. However, as the day wore on, I remember my mother became more worried that we were getting lost. She expressed her concern to my two cousins who were leading us. They wanted to take a different return route because they wanted to show us a river, which is a rare thing for folks from southern New Mexico. But as we kept going, there was no river in sight, and my mother became worried that we were lost. My cousins assured us again that we were not lost and told us about a road a short distance away that we could wait at while they went back to my grandparents' trailer to get a vehicle to give us a ride back in. Once we reached the road, my cousins and my family split up. We literally waited for hours without a single sign of my cousins or any other sign of human life for that matter. 
none of us was carrying a watch and this was obviously before cell phones so we were stranded. Eventually a red SUV type vehicle, I don't recall the make or the model, came around the mountain. We were partially relieved but also somewhat apprehensive because we didn't recognize the vehicle. The vehicle slowed down when it came closer to us without us having to flag it down. We didn't recognize the driver but he rolled down the window and asked if everything was okay. When my mother walked closer to the window to speak to him she noticed a middle-aged woman in the front seat whom she didn't recognize and, to her surprise, my two cousins in the back seat. My mom ignored the man's question and immediately started asking my two cousins where they'd been. She told them we were hungry and tired and wanted to get back to my grandparents. Amidst her concern they both ignored my mom. They just stared blankly ahead and remained silent. Initially my mom thought they were joking, but the more she tried to get a word out of them, the more awkward the situation became. They remained completely silent and expressionless, staring straight ahead throughout the entire conversation. At this point, I remember my mother becoming visibly alarmed. The man and woman then asked us again if we needed help. They were both extremely friendly and never stopped smiling. My mother, visibly shaken, declined their offer for help and motioned for us all to return to the side of the road. As we walked away, the man said, Be careful, it's easy to disappear out here, and sped off. Literally, moments later, we noticed my grandpa's van turn a corner going the opposite direction as the red SUV. Needless to say, we were immensely relieved. My grandpa stopped the vehicle right next to us and we walked around to get in. When the door opened, we noticed my two cousins were in the back seat. My mom then started shouting a mixture of anger and amusement, exclaiming what a mean prank that was. My siblings and I joined in. However, my cousins then said they had no idea what we were talking about. They said they had spent all day walking to the trailer and as soon as they got there, hopped in the van with my grandpa to come pick us up. My grandpa and cousins looked shocked at our accusations and it eventually turned into a very serious discussion with everyone recalling their exact actions along with a timeline of events. Even after all these years, my cousins swear they are telling the truth. I'm interested to hear anyone else's thoughts on my experience. Thank you.